joining us as we go so that it's all working. Um, so thank you everyone for coming along to today's lunchtime session from Alt Elisig on the Scale Up Challenge Simulation for Authentic Learning. Um, my name is Jess Humphreys, I'm from Warwick and I am um, here today to um, help and to uh, introduce the event. So I just want to um, do a really quick introduction and then I'll hand over to Debbie and Heidi. So um, we're really really glad to be joined by Debbie and Heidi today. Debbie is the Professor of Learning Innovation at Bournemouth University and her expertise lies with blended learning to motivate and engage students with their learning both inside and outside the classroom at the time and place of their choosing. Um, Debbie writes extensively on the affordances of technology such as AR, virtual immersive realities, mobile learning and um, she's passionate committed educator and national teaching fellow and involved in a number of initiatives and expert groups and we're also joined by Dr Heidi Singleton a lecturer in children and young people's nursing at the University of Bournemouth. Heidi's got a background in children and young people's nursing research where she blends evidence-based practice and innovative ideas to engage and keep pace with the changing nursing landscape. The core of her work focuses on how technology and in particular virtual reality can engage and improve students understanding of complex concepts and Heidi has conducted a research study comparing the use of virtual reality training simulation traditional, to traditional nursing education methods. So without further ado, I'd like to pass over to Debbie and Heidi um, for this alt Elisig webinar on the Scale Up Challenge, Simulation for Authentic Learning. So thank you very much for joining us. Over to you guys. Oh, thank you, Jess. That was a really lovely welcome. And it's really lovely to see um, some fellow people interested in tech, because I know most of us are up to our ears and marking at the moment. So it's just lovely to kind of um, to, to get away and to, to do something slightly different. Um, the slides are up on SlideShare. And um, the link will be there and also this is being recorded and so everything will come together very effectively on the alt pages as ever. So there's kind of three bits to today. I'm going to do a little bit about sort of the theory bit and then Heidi and I are hoping to get you doing some sort of taster immersive um, exercises that we've done with our students and tested them out so you can be guinea pigs and see how see how that works and then Heidi's going to talk a little bit more about kind of scaling up more generally with with bigger kinds of initiatives and more formal things so that's the way we were thinking it'll run so um, I just thought let's start off and you'll notice we have images of children on the slides and this is at Bournemouth every year we run a festival of learning and the first time we ran one with kind of AR and VR we had the most members of the public came to our event and the whole family just loved getting involved so I think there's something about 3D a different kind of environment a different kind of feel that that appeals and um, there's been a really interesting report came out about 18, 18 months ago, which is the, the classroom of 2030. So they were thinking about five year olds and saying, what will things look like in 2030? And so just some of the, the key points, unprecedented opportunities for collaboration, the progressive automation of lower skilled jobs, employers demand for workers with well-rounded skills and students and desires expectations to operate with autonomy and choice all indicate that our education system needs to prepare students for the future in a very different way than it has in the past and I really would um, encourage all of you to have a look if you don't follow Stephen Heppel just just have a look at his amazing stuff that he does with with schools and you know challenging and looking at different ways of learning they project just in the USA automation is going to pre is going to replace 50% of existing jobs level 4 attainment levels that's kind of our gcse those those jobs in the states are going to be declining by 11.5 million by 2030 so the kinds of jobs that people are going to be doing are really really going to change 
And if you look at fast growing occupations, what employers are wanting is higher level cognitive skills. They're looking for problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, and also socio-emotional skills. And I think when we start to look at artificial intelligence and things like that, we can really see how this, you know, is really going to be a big driver for change. And the report sort of talks about, a bit about learners need those who know and understand them as individuals to help guide them on their educational journey. So I think that's quite interesting. And a lot of us who are in higher education, we're trying to look, aren't we, at, with our virtual learning environments, whichever platform we happen to have, how can we personalize? How can we look at learner analytics? How can we make a difference? So to meet the needs, technology is going to play an increasingly critical but complementary role in how students learn and how educators support them. And I think that's quite interesting. It's really our sage on the stage to the guide on the side, isn't it, if you're familiar with that quote. Um, so the challenge is, given our current education model, less than 50% of students are going to be prepared for the fastest growing jobs. So I think that's just kind of an interesting, just a sort of an interesting thought about what are these children going to be needing and looking for? And one of the huge things in the report is they say they're going to be looking for immersive opportunities and authentic learning. And really, I guess the reason for this talk, when the call, you know, the call went out, they were, we, people, they were looking for speakers. I was just thinking a bit about the GISC report that came out last year. It talks about digital inequalities. It talks about the move to remote learning has amplified the need for pedagogical learner centered approaches. And it still says that students who engage in active and collaborative digital learning practice co-design is still very low. So we still have institutions out there that aren't really drawing upon the expertise and listening to the student body. Talking about student confidence, they talked about digital well-being and safety, that there's quite low knowledge across the piece about that. And a lot of students said they never had the opportunity to systematically develop their digital skills. Few of them engage in collaborative online activities. And we all know, don't we, that if we can create this wider learning community, we can mitigate that isolation. We can help them build networks, friendships, and maintain that, that sort of motivation to study. Um, and also, only 20% of students gain any real life simulation. And if you start to talk to people about what do you think real life simulation is in the classroom, you get some sort of um, health specialists and engineers who talk about, you know, these enormous, really, really costly um, pieces of kit that they use. And there doesn't tend to be an awful lot of sort of low cost, low tech. So that's really where we're coming from, is kind of starting to give us a bit of an overview about the range today. So, bit of theory. If, if you're interested in the theory of scaling, you can zap on the QR code and there's a paper that from the EU Learning Layers project that I worked on a few years back. And we talked about scaling and uh, scaling learning and the theories. You have to scroll down about halfway down and then you can kind of pick up all the, um, the sort of the more recent stuff on, uh, on learning theory. But I guess we're all very familiar with the diffusion of innovation model, you know, the early adopters, etc, etc, etc. But the fascinating fact for today at lunchtime is, did you know it was based on 45 farmers in the northwest of the states? And it was about scaling innovation in farming, the very original study, and look to where it's got to today. So, you know, a real spread of technology there. But I do think Roger's work does present us with a framework to understand how innovation and change can spread from a local domain to a broader constituency of adopters. 
Um, in the paper, you'll see that Greenhall did a systematic review for the NHS, a large and complex bureau bureaucracy, and um, they proposed a model for large scale innovation. But as with many of these things, you know, as academics, we can propose models, hasn't always been drawn upon, and of course, the NHS hasn't always embedded in, you know, um, innovation successfully. So, if you start to look at the theorists on scaling, Coburn particularly talks a lot about, you start off by talking about replication through social imitation to scale. And Coburn does a lot of work before this, this particular model we're going to talk about, looking at scaling and endurance over time and a shift of knowledge and authority as reform is transferred. So it really has to be a systematic change and you have to have the right culture. And in there, and then he got together with Deed and Deed and Coborn came up with these five dimensions to successful scaling. Looking at depth, sustainability, spread, ownership and evolution. Design-based research feeds really well into successful scaling of innovation. And as we know, design-based research is co-design. And you'll notice, you know, co-design is successful scaling. Are we doing a lot of co-design at the moment in universities with students? We're not. And co-design but gets everybody to buy in and helps to leverage that deep change. And so the most difficult bit is our cherished values, attitudes and beliefs. They actually need to be unlearned to enable that knowledge transformation and, on, and ownership. And um, a bit later on, I'm sure we can have a little chat about what our cherished values, attitudes and beliefs are about our tech. And this is the scaling matrix that we used when we were looking in the learning layers model to look at scaling in informal learning in workplaces. And we got the different, the different construction and health, work, health workers we were looking at to fill out a grid like this to develop the theory and to develop the practice. So I've got that up there and at some point, you know, if you are interest, interested and you've got a small scale model or a small scale innovation and you want to think a bit about how can I get, how can I start to make those changes and grow it, this scaling matrix is a really good way to kind of start that, that institutional conversation and we need evidence-based practice to start these conversations. Okay. So, as we all know, engaging our students post-COVID, we've been thinking a little bit about, you know, embedding digital technologies in teaching, learning and assessment. It's been complex and rethinking the role of educators has been at the foreground of a lot of what we've done. And I just thought it would be interested in your institution, have you and have your fellow educators rethought your practice for post-COVID or is everybody hoping to kind of backslide to the way we were? So if I just give you a moment, if you could just maybe put some things in the chat there about, you know, what you want to do. Are you rethinking and moving ahead or are you going to backslide? And what do you think about other educators? You know, just to get a bit of a feel about what's going on. So please do pop some things in chat now. Mm, thank you, Mary. So that's institutional level. Excellent. Anybody else having institutional policies thinking about, you know, rethinking the, the delivery mix? An interesting one over thinking about personalization as well. And John, uptake of blended learning. 
and some looking back to, forward to going back to normal. Yeah, we've got that. <laughs> I like that, Ivan. Yeah, very mixed reviews, a real mix. Combining old and new. Yeah, that's really good. Interesting. Mm. There's a really interesting paper I can share later, Jess, looking at here or there learning about how we can do things with some of the students are here with us and some of us are there are kind of joining in and they're trying to blend in the same time in the same space. Not everybody's enjoyed teaching online. Hmm. OK, that's really interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, it, you know, certainly in just in just in our in, in our very in, in our department, it's very, very different. And I don't think I'm ever going to travel again to do to do um, to do a PhD external examining because it just works so much better online. So yeah, great. Okay, right. So given that we are going to be the the, the move ons and rethinking our practice moving forward, let's have a little think about what we can maybe have a think about doing. So if you happen to have a Google Heart Cardboard handy, I would invite you to fish it out. And um, we're going to have a little go at thinking about how we can start to embed using things like Google Cardboard as sort of a little taster and to try and get that blend. So whether students are in the classroom with you or at home or some sort of mix, this is the sort of small scale thing that we can really be thinking about, about doing. So I'm just going to run through the couple of slides to kind of, so everybody knows what's coming and then go back and kind of talk it through more slowly. So what we're going to be doing, if you've got an Android phone, you're going to have to download a QR code reader. Um, but once we've once we're all sorted and we've got our QR code ready with your phone, you can you can go to the YouTube app and you play the experience. And then when you play the experience, there's a little cardboard symbol that turns your screen into the split screen and that will give you the feel of the 3D. And then if you've got a Google Cardboard phone, you can actually a Google Cardboard headset, you can actually put the headset in there and then it just feels a little bit more immersive. So that's what we're going to be doing. I'm just going to go back and stop sharing for a second. Now then, how do I do that? Close. I just want to go back to me. <laughs> that's my video. Marin, are you or Jess? Can you tell me how to just stop sharing for a second? Yeah, absolutely. So if you just go to file, I'll turn it up for you. Here you go. Perfect, perfect. So I wanted to kind of come up as me. Oh, perfect. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. So I think if you want to put, if you go up to the top boxes, you should be able to see either Heidi or myself. You can toggle between us and have whoever you want. But I'm just going to show you, if you have got a Google Cardboard, it looks like this. And then you're just going to unwrap it like this. It comes out like this and this. And it comes round. I'm just going to take that. There's normally a little thing that you can stick to your head, but I never worry about. I tend not to use that one. And then you just flip it round. And so what you end up doing is if I hold that up, you can see there there's kind of the, there's normally two little eyes. That's where your nose and your eyes go. And obviously you take off the cellophane. And then once we start to use the QR code and it's running, you get your phone and the phone goes in there like that. And then you can just put that up there like that. 
so I'm guessing probably because you're always old that you know you all know how to do this <laughs> but I don't you know just you just never know who's in an audience so basically that's the the Google Cardboard bit so let me share my file again and, and we if, will... if you don't have the cardboard you can still view it on your phone you just um, won't get the whole experience but you'll be able to see and get the idea Okie dokie. So let me just put my slides back up. So when you use the QR code reader, it will take you to the YouTube. It will it should link through. You shouldn't have to do anything else other than put your camera onto the QR code. Yeah. Okie dokie. I've managed to lose myself with the sharing now. How do I get back? Right. OK. It, yeah, Good just to go. To I'm sharing. fine. Yeah, I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. I'm just a bit rusty with this. OK, perfect. So I hope everybody's kind of had a few minutes to get sorted. And here's our first one. So we thought as it was lunchtime, you might like to do some relaxation. So if you've got a, an Apple phone, you just get the camera up and point the camera at the QR code and then where it says open YouTube just click on that and it will link you through I can hear somebody's got it up already lovely music in the background mm -hmm. so all then skip the advert obviously yeah. because um, I don't know so if you click then you should be able to on the bottom right hand corner press the google cardboard logo to split the screen so, so right you should at the see bottom, to split the yeah. screen yeah this little thing to split the screen and then if you move it to right left and up up and down you can see the 360 view so you move it around like that. And obviously you can actually put it in your headset so it looks like that and goes in. And you can look round and you can, if you've got your headphones, obviously you can put your headphones into the ears and then you just feel that little bit more immersive. I'm just going to go into the chat to see if anybody's everybody's OK. So if you have any difficulties, please just pop something in chat for us for a second. Heidi, just so you know, I can see the chat coming up, but I can't actually yep. contribute to the ch Oh, yes, I can. That's okay. I've got it. So I've actually used this with our nursing students when we were talking about pain, pain with children, and we were talking about what sorts of procedures and um, for what we could use this for children um, therapeutically. So we were sort of brainstorming the uses of this. Can I just check out? Do people want a few minutes more on this one or shall we move on? What I've said on the chat, Debbie, is if they click their grey icon on the centre of the console by their mute and video button, if you click the grey icon, you can put agree or disagree. So agree if you're happy to move on. Excellent. Thank you. That's brilliant.
Oh, did someone have their hand up? I think Uva did, but he's lowered yeah. it again, so Lower, I'm yeah. guessing it's okay. Ah. Uh, and Tunde is saying it was a mistake. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. It looks like most people have had to go on this one, Debbie, I'd say. I'm going to move on. We've got three examples, just so you just so you can know. We're not going to be doing this, this the, whole, the whole rest of the meeting. And this is a more health-related one. So there's lots and lots of different ones on YouTube 360 that are available to look at. And I think this starts to show you a little bit more. So a relaxation one, obviously, if you're in nursing, there's a context. Or if you're trying to do relaxation or, or something like that. But if you're an engineer, I, I'm not, I don't know, maybe I'm making terrible assumptions here. But perhaps, you know, you wouldn't be able to do that. But there are some really, really useful ones on all kinds of disciplines areas that really you can start to embed far more within your curriculum so this is the next one so yep skip the advert and don't forget to tap on the split screen icon Has anyone actually got a Google Cardboard headset today? Oh, good. It's ah, uh, Simon. It's amazing how um, with the six pounds Google Cardboard headset you can get um on Amazon, it just physically blocks out and makes it dark. And it just by using the Google Cardboard, it does um. It does really. It, it does immerse you surprisingly. There, it can. Um, it can give some people a headache or double vision, as Kat has said. Some people. Yeah, I think it's it's kind of a selection of tools that we're trying to, you know, we're trying to use, and this is one of a range. And what we found is, you know, if it's one off students wouldn't really want to go and buy one particularly so it's kind of thinking about are there maybe two or three different things that I can be using that will that you know so they can use it you know two or three times and really get the hang of it and start to, to think a little bit and they want they, they want to invest if you've got children at home um, on the YouTube app, there's a brilliant water slide and also a roller coaster one. And li little children get completely immersed and will kind of whoop and think that and sort of feel a bit frightened and feel like they're on the roller coaster or water slide. So that's fun to try it. Question, home. Pat. Absolutely, we can create them ourselves, and we're going to be coming on to that yeah. in just a minute or two. So um, I'll move on to the, the, the third one of this little series, and then we will just move on. So let me just move on one slide. And oh, oh we, oh, we only did two examples. We didn't did two. <laughs> yeah, Sorry, yeah, but, apologies um, there, I've thrown everybody. <laughs> If you just go into YouTube late, later, though, and you type in 360 VR video, you can find the water slide and roller coaster ones, which are tremendous fun. Um, so, yeah, this this one is talking about um, the fact that we have often sort of three or four students will go to our local hospital and use their £40,000 equipment to do a clinical simulation. So this is showing an acute respiratory episode and these four students were lucky enough to experience that but some of our other students who were placed at Yeovil or Dorchester um, didn't actually get to take part so we're thinking a bit about how can we share this brilliant experience with with more of our students so linking to Pat's question we have a 360 camera at the university and we're going to go ahead and film these clinical simulations in 360 
and then back on campus everyone so the 400 other students can view this using a google cardboard and then that can um, ignite discussions and and talks about clinical decision making because we have in the past haven't we we've actually periscoped a live session but it's kind of capturing it and i think quite a lot with these experiences it's being able to revisit and to to get the the, the deeper context and to really think about it and the simulation there when we visited you can see like the screen at the back that's showing the blood pressure and all of those sorts of things the person running the simulation can change all of those and then the student nurses have to adapt so it's trying to really get you know get get the sort of the raw footage and then we can think about ways in which we can sort of frame questions and have little standalone exercises for 10 minutes and th those sorts of things that are going to enhance the rest of what we're offering okay i'm just going to go on to the next slide and this is something that our paramedic team ran last month because we don't have anyone in our underground car park and our paramedic students aren't able to be out on the ambulances as much as they would like to be with COVID because it's a very close situation obviously um, and I'm going to just see if I can link show you the video clip now then I thought that would link through and it's not playing live um hmm. that's just gone bigger hmm. So, um, sorry, just to interrupt here, what might make it easier um, is to stop sharing the slides and just share either a tab or the screen. Um, Perfect. And then if you select a tab or a screen um, on some browsers, there's a little option <laughs> window where you have to tick share sound as well as the actual video. So we can stop sharing the slides if that's easier. Okay, what I'll do then, I might just pop the videos, the link into the chat and then people can have a look at that so I don't kind of lose myself. So hold on just mm -hmm. one second. So let me just get the link. Give me one second. And we can give people just a minute to do that, can't we? So we're using YouTube quite a lot. I've just popped it up there, so I'll just wait for a second so people have the chance to kind of have a look on their phones and things like that. And that one looks like you've um, captured it through Zoom onto Panopto. It is. I have. Yep. I have indeed. <laughs> so this particular one, um, just while people are starting to have a little look, is um, the main thing with paramedics is running simulations, running live sessions, it's debriefing with their clinical professionals. And so setting up this underground scenario with their five different different sets of um, sets of um, people with horrendous injuries. Um, what that does is it just offers them the chance to really think think a bit about how to evacuate everybody and then they also have had one of the ambulances that they'd kind of um, put boxes and everything all round and the students had to improvise with um, a backboard to evacuate one of our one of our simulator dolls and to evacuate that and with, they had like a slalom course for getting somebody safely out Right, I'm just going to stop just for a second because it's a 57 minute clip and I know there's mm -hmm. some really interesting sounds there. So I'll just give everyone a minute on silent and then we'll kind of reconvene.
if people can add, either say something in chat or if you go to the mm -hmm. grey button in the middle of the screen and say sort of ready to move on, there's a faster thing, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Where you can say faster, faster. I'm yeah. ready. <laughs> and you can clear it as well then when you're done. Yeah, and all of these things that we've that we've developed, you know, these very small scale 360, you can also put into an Oculus Quest 2 and then it's just amazing. Yeah. So um, the last time we were all on campus together and we had um, we had the um, the of this, the Save a Heart Day, you know, where everybody learns how to do the CPR and we have a public day. We had the crash dummy there. We had our Google Cardboards there and we also had one of the Heart 360. So it actually felt like you were going through a heart there on the Oculus Quest. And so you just had, you know, people just having a really, really different kind of different set of sensory experiences and it really really helps help to engage the public and to make that you know somebody's heart in their chest just much more much more real now <clears throat> jess heidi are we ready to move on a little yes okay. I'm, just, I'm just typing the, the cost of an oculus quest around 400 pounds and then the Perfect. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. So next. So okay. Heidi, over to you. Yes. So if you can just scan the Mentimeter, um, I won't toggle over to presenter mode, but if you yeah. can QR code the Menti, we'd like to know what ideas do you have for using resources like this in learning development? So if you can take a bit of time, um, actually, if I do, how do I toggle over to me presenting? You've got presenter rights. I think I just stopped presenting. Show control. Not sure how I share screen. Uh, dun, dun, dun. Marin, can you stop me presenting so Heidi can pick up? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. There Thank we are. Thank you. Okay, so How Heidi, do you've I got do presenter that? rights now. So if yep. you open the collaborate tab at the, bo the bottom, and then you can, it, it prompts you to, to get a screen up. Marin will be able to help if, you, if you're not quite sure. Share content. Share. Yeah, that's right. That's it. Share screen. Yep. yep. That's it. So if you've got, um, if you've got an sharing? Android phone, is that sharing the cloud? Not yet. Hang on. Ooh. Yay. We need we were nearly there. We were nearly Ooh. there. Yes, there we go. Fantastic. Well yep. done, everyone. <laughs> so if you've got an Android phone and the QR trigger doesn't work, the Menti code Jess has very kindly put up in the chat. Thank you. Safety induction, play games. Oh, see impossible places. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. Virtual gallery client advice, immersive scenarios, taking instructions, teacher training, lab skills, incident management, so quite a lot of unsafe, un things that are unsafe, um, immersive scenarios, overcoming anxiety. In fact, when I asked my boys what they'd like to have on a 360 or a, on a digital world that we can program, they wanted to fly and they wanted to go to space and they wanted they wanted to go to see penguins so they want to go somewhere you know or some something brought to them where they are creativity field courses virtual museum tours yeah there were quite a few of those during lockdown weren't there so we'll take a picture of that I've got a photograph oh, of it. Got it. <laughs> I, will, I will tweet that out to the hash LSIG. <laughs> okay, so let's come back. That should have I stopped. Oh, have I given hacked. it back to you? Um, yes, have I Have I given to... you back the power? <laughs> I just need to get mine up again. I was just going to say to Pat, um, Mentimeter does have a kind of a, prof a profanity filter, but students can get round of it because students are really, really smart. <laughs> I've never had unpleasant students' comments so far, Touchwood. <laughs> oh, I have. Yeah. <laughs> um, Right, I think I need presenter rights back, Marin, because I can't. Oh, let me just see if I can share my file. <laughs> oh, here we go. Got, you, know, got, you need um, the authority. 
Debbie no, no, needs the authority. I'm, no, no, I think I'm good. <laughs> Let me just show now. Okie dokie. And I just need to. Pick oh no, this racism time. when using it. There have oh, been that's dreadful. Oh, no. oh, that's awful. Right. Okay. So. So thank you for all those really wonderful ideas. We were just going to just have a little pause now because we've kind of been talking for quite a long time and had you doing lots of things. And we just wondered, you know, are there any kind of initial thoughts or discussions about some of the ideas that people were thinking about? So Jess, if you'd be kind enough to either to manage if people want to put their hands up and to say something or, you know, if you want to put some things in the chat or any thoughts or comments, that would be really good. And then Heidi will kind of just sort of just wrap up, wrap up with some kind of some of the, the sort of higher tech stuff that we that we've been doing. It's so I'm just I'm just looking through um, the comments at the moment and then um, obviously there's some things coming through about Mentimeter but it is it's really interesting to see how virtual reality can open up new opportunities for students um, it's accessibility and inclusive wise do you have backup because people don't have the equipment or um, I guess that's so, my big concern yeah so what we've done um, when we've been um, so I've I've done an I've used this in a large-scale lecture theater so there's always going to be students whose phones are too big or it's a phone that's not new enough to support some of our software that we've created so they tend to just use each other's and sort of share um, when we've accessed it through laptops again if they've got a macbook sometimes it doesn't work so again they've shared um, and then i suppose if they're if they're in halls of residence again they get together and share share bits but yeah there can be some um hardware issues with these things and of course quite a lot of the sharing stuff we did was before covid so now that's why we're trying to think of building things in more strategically so people will have their own although with the oculus quest and things like that you can now get these hygiene face masks that are really cheap so you can catch you know so you can use and wipe down in between and there's some really really good um good briefings on how to do that to, so you can share a little a little more widely i think really it's about making your whole content Content very accessible and if you think about it you know if we look at sort of the classroom of sort of even 10 years ago everything we shared was text and where you've got these immersive kind of opportunities in a class it's helping to bread to broaden out different ways of accessing learning so if you think about my heart simulation that we were doing with the public, you know, there was a piece of paper where you could read about how to do CPR. You could try on a, a SIM doll and do practical CPR. You could use your own device and do and have a look at it. And then you could be virtually immersed. So it's really just trying to think about those wider kinds of issues. And the really nice thing about particularly about creating 360 videos is, of course, you're doing the audio as well. And I think, you know, where you've got supporting podcasts or you've got screens as well as as, as well as language, that makes a really, really, really good, good sort of range of things. So don't forget, you know, you're going, never going to be doing a two hour session and doing it all this way. You know, you'll be embedding all sorts of other things as well. Good point. Thank you. I think there's a couple of questions coming through on chat about um, visually impaired students and the backup for those yeah. that are visually impaired. So that's the audio, obviously. Yeah. So there's the audio and they can they can certainly take take part. I do think in health, it's slightly different because students have to be what they call fit for practice. And so if you did have somebody that was visually impaired, it's very unlikely they'd be able to come onto a nursing or a paramedic program. So perhaps it's slightly different in health. And I think certainly you'd have to think much more carefully about the range of materials you're, you're supplying in a particular session. And you'd be wanting to be thinking as inclusively as possible. And there's one more question from Sarah about relevant 360 stock images or videos that you recommend. Well, there's lots. And if you have a look on the 360 um, VR on on YouTube, there's lots and lots and lots. Um, a 360 camera is about £120. So we've actually had our students using them to create 
as sort of as um, you know as formative assessment um, and we've We've been working at Bournemouth University over the last couple of years. We've just changed our assessment policy, um, you know, the actual policy documents to enable far wider and more authentic assessments. And we're encouraging staff to pilot. And we did find that was one thing that COVID made us do was to try and move away from the three hour exam and to think about different ways of looking at assessment. But I think it's fair to say not every, you know, we need some really good pilots to be able to show the affordances because you'd have to check all sorts of, all sorts of things with using technology for assessment, as, as we know. Um, right. If there's nobody with hands up, I shall move on. Uh, okay. So, brief overview now of some high-tech solutions. Um, Heidi, just to save the toggle time, if you just tell me when you're ready to move. So, this well, is a lovely don't, don't project. Don't worry about toggling. <laughs> uh, yeah, so to save some toggle time, um, what I'll probably get you to do is, is look at the video of our software later because there's a walkthrough. So, what we did is we worked with a company and they actually, so, so far we've been looking at 360, which is really just 360 of real life. And then you can also have digital environments made. Obviously, you need to either use students at the university to build these or work with a company. So we made one for diabetes, a deteriorating patient with diabetes. And the YouTube walkthrough would show you more. If you mind just popping onto the next slide, please. Government yeah, style. I, just, I have just popped Thank you. the link to your YouTube Thank you. into the chat. Thank you. So in a nutshell, um, we did a randomized control trial with 171 um, second year nursing students. They actually had um, superior learning gain compared to those not using the VR software. This was accessed through a laptop. Even if they hadn't used virtual reality before, they were able to use it quickly and intuitively. Um, um, students who had um, dyslexia and other learning needs found it really um, inclusive because we had text box popping up as well as the virtual ward scene um, scenario and they liked the instant feedback and personalized learning <clears throat> so um, the students really um, I might be able to move to the next one actually enjoyed using it so thinking about our topic today though about scalability ah it's showing some of the um, it's because we're not doing a slide share, isn't it? You think you need to put it into slideshow, Shai? Uh, what, uh, what I'll do is I'll ask the question and then show you the next slide. So Perfect. the question, this question is though, when we've worked with this um, software company, so we've paid them a small amount of money for a proof of concept, um, digital, digital ward with a patient and the student is the avatar. So it's been fantastic learning, but what do you think are the barriers? If you can put them in the chat. Uh, what are the challenges we face for scaling and innovating using this software? Oh, I'm just going to leave that off the screen now. <laughs> <laughs> there <you> go. <laughs> so what problems do you think we've had with, you know, trying to move, use 360, trying to do larger control trials? What do you think all what? What are the issues we've had? Money, money, money. money, money. That's money. an excellent yeah. one, John. Absolutely yeah. right. Anything else? So I actually did the research with an academic and learning technologists who were assisting the students. And so a lot of the barriers and scalability issues um, um, came from the learning tech technicians and academic. Yeah, you're right, Kat, as well. You have to do fantastic briefings with external companies. Yeah time to develop and the confidence time. absolutely yeah lots of people so money and time so just going popping back to our slide so te technically the software was not always stable it would crash and frustrate students and it, it was actually the learning technologists working with the students sometimes felt a bit stressed um, they thought a student experience might be damaged if the students um, software kept crashing they were worried about how the students would perceive that the variety of different phones if they were old or too large um, the types of different laptops if they had Macs the software didn't always work on growing ongoing subscription and IP ownership dilemmas 
and then obviously amongst colleagues and management the the vision um, to invest in this um, moving forward and as you say the time and confidence to dip their toe in the water oops okay so right. Oh, I was just going to I was just going to say so going full circle hmm. we actually tried this software approach first and working with the company we tried this first and now from what we've learned from this we are now using 360 video and Google Cardboards and Oculuses and that's we're finding a cheaper and more scalable approach moving forward sorry Debbie Absolutely, no, that's fine. And then I was just going to finalize, finally say, and this is an even more immersive one. Um, this is a beautiful project that some of you may know Professor Liz Falconer and Virtual Avebury. And um, Liz worked with us for two years. And so we were very much involved with the work as she was going round it. And you could go to the, um, the Avebury Stone Circle. And in their visitor center, you could visit Avebury in 3D exactly as it been created 2,000 years ago and the grasses you can see are the grasses from 2,000 years ago and the music and it's just absolutely amazing so um, that was just a really different way to kind of think a bit about um, how to to do something really large and that was and with that we had a proof this had a proof of concept and then she went out to look for funding um, and the initial findings, there was a really interesting thing. Um, you tend to think that it's more mature ladies that that will go to places like, you know, Na National Trust, Virtual Heritage, all of these sorts of things. And they absolutely loved the virtuality of it. And it just sort of blew away loads of preconceptions about who really enjoys using immersive, immersive technologies. So that's our final slide. And just so you know, we've got all of the resources there, um, lots of links. Um, Heidi's got a whole range of papers underway from her doctorate. And then we've got links through to um, different YouTube clips that Heidi did as she was going through. And um, you can have a little look at that. So I think we are just about at seven minutes to. So hopefully we've got time for a bit of a discussion. If I'll stop sharing and come back on the screen, unless anybody wants to go back to something particular at the moment. Thank you so much, Heidi and Debbie. That's that's really, really fascinating and inspiring stuff there. Um, if you do have any questions, do post them in the chat or put your hand up and we can come to you. I know there was one about um, software recommendations. and I know, Heidi, you're going to get back yeah. to you about that. Um, yes, yes, yeah, I confess I don't actually do the filming at the moment. I believe it's fairly simple. We have a fabulous learning technologist, John Moran, who who comes with us and does the filming, but I will ask him. And also, I think it would be brilliant if he could show me. It's not very difficult to do the 360, I understand. So I'm hoping he'll show me and then I'll know how to do it so I can get back to you about the software. Yeah. Pat, yes, you can make your mock your own 360 up. There's some examples on how to do that on YouTube. So you can take a bit of cardboard and some scissors and some sellotape and you can have a go at doing it. But most students, if you're going to use it more than once, they're happy to pay the four or five pounds. Uh, what was Pat Clark's question about oh, Pat, expenses? She was just saying, she when she said about creating Google Cardboard, I'd misunderstood and answered a different question, but she was actually saying, you know, if students have a lot of expenses. But I do think it's interesting how Google Cardboard can be the scalable option and it isn't too expensive. And I think yeah. that's what we're trying to do because, you know, um, you know, we do make assumptions that Russell groups have loads and loads of money. But I think at the moment, nobody's got loads and loads of money to spend on things. And it's just trying to get those little wow bits into our teaching and our, and our students learning. 
we actually found out a lot from using the Google Cardboard as well um, through my randomized control trial. You can look at the papers when they're published about what what Google Cardboard's good for and what it's not good for. So my software, if you watch the video later, um, the nursing deteriorating patient was actually really interactive. And so for Google Cardboard, that made the students feel sick. And so for that one, it was best access, access non-immersively through laptop. So it depends what you're doing and how interactive your software is and what, you know, so it's the technology suiting the learning objective and what you want to do. That, that makes sense. No, thank you. Yeah. Okay, are there any more questions out there? No, and a big thank you to John. He's put it, he's found the link on how to make a Google Cardboard and put them in the chat. Well done, Brilliant. John. Fantastic. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I know I'm going to be doing this afternoon, having a bit of a play and watching some of the videos. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to, this has been a really great um, session, really inspiring. Thank you so, so much for your time and thank you everyone for coming today. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now. Um,